Okay, so here we've got our second market structure. The four market structures could be organized by degree of competition, where perfect competition is the most competitive and monopoly would be the least competitive. We see here our three key characteristics. We had for perfect competition, there were many firms. With monopoly, there'll be one. With the type of product for perfect competition, it was similar or identical or standard. For monopoly, it will be unique, which is sort of by definition, because if there's only one firm making it, then whatever it is they're making has to be unique. And then you have the ease of entry for perfect competition. It was very easy to enter, where, and this is the key one really for monopoly, is it's completely blocked. It's not difficult, it is blocked, and we will discuss the four typical reasons entry would be blocked in just a moment. And then as an example, we are given here water utility, any sort of utility, electric utility, where the government has said this one company shall provide this product. That would be an example of a monopoly. All right, so let's look at each one of these a little bit closer. The significance of being the only firm, let's think about that. When we looked at perfect competition, we had a firm demand curve and we had a market demand curve. If you are the only one, then your firm demand curve is the market demand curve and vice versa, right? The market demand curve is the firm, the firm demand curve is the market. So that'll be important. The unique product, um, this is, like I said, one thing it's obvious because if you're one firm, you're the only one that can make it. The product is by definition unique. But another way that we can use Monopoly, and this is not really how we're going to be using it in this class, but you can use it in a more broad way where especially when you get lawyers involved and you're trying to argue does a company have monopoly power does it does it function as a monopoly is it there nobody really competing with them and so one of the things you can start arguing is is there a close substitute to this product and if the answer is yes then you would say they don't really have a monopoly and if the answer is no they tend to say it's more likely to be a monopoly so let me let me use electricity is there a substitute to electricity? I would tend to say no. <laughs> um, but people who go camping, people who live off the grid, they would all say they're able to function just fine without electricity. Um, and what do we mean by electricity? Maybe I mean um, electricity generated, generated by a plant brought to me from power lines. So then there'd be substitutes like maybe installing your own solar panels and no, 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 no. All right, so is, is the electricity provided by our, um, you know, our center point firm, is it really unique or not? And that's where lawyers can argue. But that's where you just start arguing about what is a close substitute. And I'm pretty comfortable saying there's no real close substitute to electricity coming into my house from the power lines. And so in that sense, we would hold them as unique. Again, um, or you know, as a monopoly. So we're not going to worry too much about those sorts of degrees, but I do want to mention it because it is a factor um, in economics when discussing monopolies and monopoly power. Okay, and then the blocked entry is where we want to go next, which is um, different books will come up different lists. We're going to go through four possible sources that would block entry. The significance of blocked entry has to do with what we just talked about in perfect competition in the long run. When profits existed in the long run, or as you got to the long run, I should say, as you move towards the long run in perfect competition, the existence of profits told other firms, hey, come on in. Um, and so as firms would enter, the supply curve for the market would increase. Number of firms increases, supply increases, equilibrium price dropped, and you were not going to be able to maintain profits in the long run in perfect competition. If you could have blocked entry, though, you could, and that's going to be the significant factor here for Monopoly. Okay, here we see the four sources that will prevent other firms from entering. So one of our three key characteristics was entry is blocked. Here are the four possible reasons entry might be blocked. Um, some economists argue that the really the only source of monopoly is this first one, that government blocks the entry. Um, these two here tend to be a more temporary condition that will resolve itself. And then some economists would also argue natural monopoly is the one source of, of monopoly that would happen and continue for a time period, even without 
blocking entry. Although, you know, economists, we don't agree with each other. Some would argue that even this would resolve over time, maybe through being replaced by technology, don't know. And that, again, this is really the true source of where a monopoly comes from. But any one of these four situations can, at least for a time, be the reason that entry is blocked and in that sense provide a firm a monopoly. So let's talk about each one of them. Government blocking the entry um, is some sort of regulation law has been passed uh, and saying that this good, this service can only be provided by this firm. And that's basically what we mean by government blocking the entry. It can be what they call a public franchise where um, it's the right to provide electricity to a certain area of homes or provide water or to do first class mail has been exclusively provided or exclusively um, allowed to be provided by one firm. And that's one way you can do it as a public franchise. Uh, public franchise. The other is by granting a patent or copyright or something along the lines of that that gives one firm the exclusive right to produce a product. Again, there's a lot of debates about the usefulness of this. The general mainstream way of thinking is you need this sort of protection of intellectual property to encourage people to want to make the investment in creating something so that they know, then know at least for a time period they have a monopoly. Um, so uh, public franchise, patents, copyrights, these are the sorts of things that gives one firm and only one firm the right to a product or a service and therefore entry is blocked from any other firm and they would have a monopoly in that sense. They'd be the only firm and the product would be unique. All right, control over key resource. <clears throat> All right, this one does not tend to happen very often, and when it does happen, it does not last. But during the time period that, that a firm controls some resource that is necessary to make the product, you can see that they could be the only firm producing a unique product and have been able to block entry because they have control of the resource. Nobody else can get to it. Some of the examples that were, have been given in various books over the years would be Alcoa for a time period in the 20th century had control of the aluminum market. Um, there was this family who grew poinsettias and uh, developed some, some technique that just made theirs better than everybody else's. The look, the leafiness, the bushiness. Nobody else knew how to make a poinsettia that looked like that. And so they became the sole source of poinsettias. Um, and so both of these examples and others that you can come up with did result in one company producing a unique product and entry was essentially blocked, but it does tend to resolve itself over time. You know, a new technology is invented. Maybe somebody else either um, discovers a technique like the poinsettias on their own or they come up with something complementary or, or, or at least substitute, I should say, substituting that technique. And so, you know, you lose your, your um, claim to being the only one that can provide it. Um, something like you're the only one that has... No, you, you have total control of all the sources of aluminum, except you don't have control over the world. So it just it increases the dollar incentive for somebody to go out and find a new source. And at some point, that will happen. So like I said, it doesn't tend to give you a monopoly for the long run, but it can for a while. Um, so during the time that you have a control of a key resource, you could be one firm with blocked entry um, that does have a unique product. Nobody else can produce it. Okay, network externalities. All right, first of all, we need to know what that phrase means. Um, it, a, net, a product has a network externality when using it, um, the usefulness of using it is actually growing because everybody else uses that product too. So imagine telephones when they first came into existence and you're rich enough to afford a telephone. How useful was it when you could get the phone and you know 99.95 percent of the people out there don't have a phone? You don't have anybody to call. But as they began to be installed in businesses in a few homes, then that next person who's thinking, "Hey, should I get a phone or not?" sees it being a little bit more useful because there are other people with the phone. And as more and more people install the phone, the, the, the value of having a phone is getting higher and higher and higher. We see this in more recent things um, like technology. Let's do the 1980s. There was a time where the programs and the, the, the documents you would make on a PC could not be seen or read on an Apple. And PCs had huge dominance in, in uh, offices. 
Um, and so you're thinking about getting a computer, you could go Apple, you could go PC. There was a huge value to using the PC, even if you might have preferred the Apple, because more people could see and, and use your documents and share your documents. So that's kind of an example of a network externality. Um, any of these social media sites, Facebook, even if people complain about it and think there could be a better product design that does a similar thing, it's hard to get one off the ground because to get a few people to come over, what value is it to be on this Facebook alternative if nobody else is on it? Um, so it's, it's, again, these network externalities don't work as a, it's maybe not the strongest creation or uh, creation of a barrier to entry, but it can exist for a period of time and it can essentially give you a monopoly where you're the one firm with a unique product and for however long until somebody figures out a way to get around it, um, your entry is blocked. All right, so finally we get to the fourth one, natural monopoly. And this one is being driven by the cost curves, the environment the firm is operating in. And so the difference between a natural monopoly and a government blocking entries, even if the government has blocked the entry, if, if for some reason they took away their legal protection, a natural monopoly is going to stay a monopoly. And what it basically comes down to is the cost of, of production is, is actually lower when one firm does the production than if you split the market into two or three parts. So we want to look a little closer at natural monopoly. Okay, so here we want to look at what we mean by natural monopoly and have an understanding of how, how this works as a barrier to entry. Okay, so what I've drawn here is we've got a market demand um, which, of course, is the firm demand, potentially, if this is a monopoly. We have the market demand, and that gives you a sense of what quantity the, mar the people are even willing to consume. Um, and then you have your average total cost curve. So this is what I mean by this happening naturally, because this is just the cost structure of this industry. That what we see, then, is as the quantity goes up, the average total cost is falling over pretty much all the range of the demand curve. Up until we get to 1,000 units, we see average total cost falling. In fact, it even looks like it continues to fall until you get out to here. And eventually, as we know, an average total cost curve will turn up. So this is what we call this portion of the average total cost curve when it's falling as quantity goes up is called economies of scale. And then you get to maybe the constant returns to scale, and then you get to the diseconomies of scale. So what does economies of scale mean, if we can remember back to that? It means that as I expand output, my average cost is falling. It's actually cheaper for me to produce if I expand my output. And so what a natural monopoly is, is a, a, a company, no, I should say it's an industry, where it's actually cheaper for one firm to produce than two. So let's say the amount that was going to be produced is in the vicinity of a thousand. Your average cost of producing a thousand units is one dollar. Okay. So if that's the situation, what if we just came in and took the one firm that was producing a thousand units and busted them in half and said, okay, we're going to have two firms producing 500. The average cost, and so we're going to have two firms that are essentially producing at this $2 average cost. What is naturally going to happen, hence the name, is one firm is going to realize that if they start to expand their output, their average cost is actually falling. It's getting cheaper for them to produce as they grow. And they're able to actually sell the product for less than this poor guy that didn't <laughs> expand his output. He's finding himself getting shoved up the cost curve. He's going up higher and higher and higher as he loses his ability to produce because this other guy is expanding, able to lower price, and still make profit. And so that's why we're saying is that you, you will not have two firms in such an industry. And in an industry such as I've drawn here, it's just naturally going to fall to the point where one firm will produce for the market. And it's actually a good thing for the consumers because one firm can do it more cheaply than two. And so that's the idea of natural monopoly and that's the idea of um, barriers to entry. So we've covered now what a monopoly is, its three key characteristics, as well as the four sources of barriers to entry.
From here, the next thing we'd want to do is to start looking graphically at how a monopoly will determine its profit maximizing output and, and you know, show it graphically. So we'll do that in, in the next video.